Welcome everybody. We're so glad that you're joining us today for our fourth Snake River Dinner Hour. We have live Spanish interpretation today and the instructions for accessing that will be in the chat. This is a moderated conversation among a group of experts with our moderator, Alyssa Macy, asking questions. Today's topic is how do we transport grain without the dams? We're going to discuss the largest river restoration opportunity in history, the regional benefits of stopping salmon extinction, the impacts that restoration will have on the transportation system in the Snake River region, and the solutions we can find together if we have the courage to have the conversation. These aren't easy issues to discuss, but we're doing it here today. Our next two webinars will zoom in on the science of why the removal of the dams is essential to stop salmon extinction and its impact on our larger ecosystem. You can sign up for those webinars at snakeriverdinnerhour.com. We also welcome you to drop questions in the chat or the Q&A box. Although please know that this is a conversation kind of like a dinner party, so we may not get to your question, but our moderating team will be reading them all and we'll take them into account for future conversations. To wrap us up tonight, we'll have Abby Abramovich, an organizer with Idaho Conservation League, share some opportunities to provide public input on this process. We're honored to have Alyssa Macy, the CEO of Washington Environmental Council as our moderator today. Thank you so much for being here, Alyssa. I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Johanna. Welcome everyone to tonight's dinner at Howard. We're so happy that you could be with us tonight for this important conversation. I am joined this evening by a number of experts. And so before we get started, I'd like to do just the quickest introduction of them, names and titles only, and we'll drop their bios in the chat function. We're joined tonight by Brian Jones, who's a wheat farmer near Dusty, Washington. Paul Dedilius, owner and operator of Columbia Rail. Rob Masanis, Vice President for Western Conservation with Trout Unlimited. Lisa McShane, researcher for American Rivers. And finally, Sam White, Chief Operating Officer of Pacific Northwest Farmers Cooperative. Welcome everyone tonight. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started um, by asking a, a question, uh, and I encourage the panelists just to, to work off of one another. Um, I'm here to, to moderate, but I know that when I have a bunch of experts in the room, a lot of times my best moderation is just to step back. So um, we'll start off uh, today on our topic with a question for you, Lisa. Before the dams were built 50 years ago, how did wheat get to market? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. And I, I have to point out, Alyssa's asking me that because my great grandparents settled a wheat farm between Connell and the Snake River. And uh, until the uh, end of the 60s, I think they, uh, of course, shipped wheat via train, via rail out of Connell, Washington. And, and today they ship wheat on the river um, uh, down by wind dust. Thank you. Um, Sam and Brian. There's a, a lot of, I think, questions for those of us who don't farm about how things actually get shipped around. So can you tell us how farmers decide how to ship their grain? How do they weigh the price, the convenience, and the reliability in that process? Go ahead, Brian, if you want to start, or I can. I think you're muted, Brian. After you, Sam. Okay. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of it is a financial decision, you know, basically where their farm is at, uh, you don't want to truck it a long ways because uh, every mile you truck it, uh, you know, the, the more it's going to cost you. So you want to get it to a facility, whether that is a river terminal or a, uh, rail terminal or a sub country warehouse that will eventually move it the, the most financially feasible way. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of, I, it, I would see it as what's most convenient for them, but usually what is most convenient, I would think would be the most financially beneficial for them as well. Uh, Sam, can I ask you a question? Yes. I never really base my price of whether it goes by rail or by barge i really look at where do i get my wheat from usually i get it from a grain company and what's the closest um uh, elevator or terminal that i can get to 
uh, would you say that would you say that's true that people don't really choose rail or barge they choose what's most economically beneficial uh, yes and i'm sorry if i made that made that made it sound like that it is like i said where it's usually where it's closest to them is going to be the most financially appealing way for them but you're right it's you know it's whatever's convenient for them Yeah, somebody who grew up in a family-owned business, I totally understand uh, thinking about all the variables and looking for the, the thing that's going to cost the least amount of money. Um, when you are a family-owned business, you, you worry a lot about paying your employees, also paying yourself, staying in business. It's a lot to think about. Um, and I, I can only imagine in farming, there must be so many variables that one must think about uh, when you're deciding how to ship your grain. Uh, Lisa, the four Lower Snake River dams were built largely for barge transportation. They cost $1 billion to build at the time, which is close to $10 billion in today's dollars, adjusting for inflation. In that context, has barging been successful? You know, it's been, I will say it's been uh, important over time, but the use of barges has declined substantially over the last 20 or so years. Uh, it's, uh, they no longer ship containers, uh, petroleum doesn't go up the river. Um, so uh, grain goes down the river and um, fertilizer products. I, I, I just wanna give a mention because I see Leslie from McGregor is on um, and she was explaining to me uh, that uh, how valuable barging is for uh, getting their fertilizer products up the river. Uh, so it's you know one of those um, pieces that seems small but is important in the region. Um, but overall, the barging has, um, you know, it's declined uh, something on the order of, gosh, I think 75% is what the data is. It just hasn't panned out to be what it was, what people hoped back in the 50s and 60s. Thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, things change over time, right? That's sort of inevitable as things happen. And, and I'm thinking about um, a question for you, Rob. When these dams were built, the builders didn't take into account the costs, um, economic, and of course, in terms of cultural and life ways, specifically to tribal nations in the region. What other costs um, go into maintaining these dams? Like, what does it actually cost to maintain the dams and the navigation channel when we're thinking about the total cost? Because I, I don't, you know, as, as a person who's not sort of in this world, um, I can make some assumptions, but I'm curious, like of all the pieces that are out there, what is the actual cost to, to operate these things? Yeah, it's a great question, Alyssa. Um, and I'm not an expert on this particular topic, although I've been working on, on, on Snake River salmon recovery for many, many years now. And so I definitely have encountered this issue in the past. I mean, uh, if you look at the most recent analysis that the the what they call the action agencies have done, it's over 140 million dollars a year in capital and O and M to maintain these dams. So these are big pieces of infrastructure, and they require a lot of maintenance, and they require periodic rebuilding. And that's not just, you know, so that's the energy production piece of it. It's the navigation piece of it. So the locks, the dredging that goes along with that, it's the fish and wildlife costs. You have fish passage facilities. Um, when the dams went in, uh, we built what's known as a lower snake compensation program, which is a series of hatcheries to try to replace the dam, the uh, the fish that um, would be lost, known, they, they knew them at the, at the time they would be lost when the dams were built. So all that is infrastructure and requires constant maintenance and, and repair. And so that's a pretty big price tag annually of $140 million. And then there are some extraordinary expenses associated with big energy uh, investments like in rewinding turbines and things like that. You know, I want to jump in and respond to that because I uh, I'm from the Tri Cities, from a farming family, but I've lived my adult life um, on the northwest coast of Washington State. And when I when my husband and I moved to Bellingham in the early '80s, um, 
it was, you know, it was a vibrant fishing community. And, uh, and that was true of the entire Washington coast. And in the last 30 years, I've seen firsthand those industries be decimated. And, um, and that's something we don't quantify enough. And, um, you know, we, we talk, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot with farmers and, and about concerns, but I've actually seen the decline in these other industries. And if we can do some things to keep those industries alive. Um, why wouldn't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when when you mentioned fish, you know, I think about also tribal folks that have fished along that river since the beginning of our time, right? And the inability these days to, to catch fish, um, how that impacts people's, you know, spiritual and cultural uh, life ways is really profound. And, and I think as a, as a tribal person who's in, works in this area and thinks about this all the time, I, I'm, all, I'm always wondering like, what would it be if, it, if those dams weren't there? How would people be living? Not just tribal people, but other people as well. Like how would we be living if they were never there? Um, and so it's, it's a big question and certainly no tribal person is gonna put a price on what we lost, but we know that the losses are profound for us, in addition to losses for other communities that relied on fish. Um, Lisa, you know, we're, we're talking about transportation tonight, and I'm curious to, to know how much wheat actually travels on the Snake River, the Columbia, um, and what about um, wheat that is traveling also by rail? Oh, sure. Um, and we're going to have some uh, materials on uh, the website, I hope, later if people want to download any data. Who doesn't love a lot of data? Um, but I did look at the, um, the all the shipments up and uh, upbound, downbound out of Ice Harbor and um, Bonneville. And it's about 2.2 million tons of grain going um, downbound on um, the snake. And, uh, and through Bonneville then it's about 4.9 million. So, um, you know, it roughly doubles going down the Columbia. Um, but we ship, um, gosh, something like 16 million tons out of the Columbia River ports. And what gets confusing, uh, some folks say that it's the Columbia snake system. Um, it's a big difference between what happens on the snake and what happens at the ocean ports at the mouth of the Columbia. So that's where the rail lines uh, enter the picture. And, um, you know, something like 60% of the rail that ships out of those ocean ports or of the wheat that ships out of the ocean ports gets there by rail. So those are big ports. We feed the world. And that's something, you know, I think is wonderful. And it's that wheat's coming from Kansas and North Dakota and Oregon, Idaho, Montana, big wheat state. Uh, Japan uh, corporations have invested significantly into shuttle rail in Montana because they like that wheat for noodles. Um, so, uh, so that's the the snake is a is a portion of it. It's under ten percent of our U.S. exports, um, but most of it goes out of the um, big ports on, on the Columbia. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm thinking, I know that we have another panelist that isn't here uh, at the moment, so hopefully he'll be um, uh, for him to come back. Um, and I had a question for him about how much wheat from actually comes from Montana and the Dakotas. I don't know if anybody else um, is able to answer that. If not, I can ask another question. Yeah, I, I really don't know the numbers that, that comes out of Montana. Um, yeah. Not as much comes out of the Dakotas. It would, uh, as far as I know, there's none that comes from Kansas this far. Any of the Kansas wheat would either go to mills or go down to the Gulf. Um, occasionally, you might see a little bit of uh, Nebraska when markets get really messed up. But for the most part, it's the Pacific Northwest states and uh, Montana. I, some people include Montana in the PNW and some don't. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. I do, I do want to add real quick. It is a fair amount from North Dakota. I can, um, and you're right about Kansas, but uh, sorry, I misspoke. But uh, North Dakota does supply um, a fair amount uh, out of the PNW. It, it kind of, I think it depends on pricing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, like I said, I really, I'm sorry, I don't know those numbers. I, I know the farther... Uh, east you go the you know it gets more expensive and so they look for 
other places for the market of that. And at times when the market is better off the West Coast, it's going to draw bushes farther. Good point. Excellent. Um, I, you know, one of the things that that I've heard is that grain cooperatives have been expanding rail capacity in eastern Washington. Sam, can you give us some insight as to why that is? You know, I think it's uh, a strategic move on the cooperatives. Uh, we've seen consolidation in the time that I've been in the business in the, uh, you know, 30 plus years that I've been doing this. We've gone from a lot, every small town had its own little co-op. Today, there's, you know, a handful. Uh, they've consolidated, they've merged, uh, just, it's just been the way that business has gone. And so we've all gotten bigger. We need to find ways to transport our product to the marketplace. And so strategically, um, shuttle train systems have found a place in the, in the uh, Washington where the we've seen them go up. Um, I'm not here to say that that's the way to move it all because uh, the river is still very important to a lot of us. I know it's a small percentage of what goes out of the United States, but it's a huge percentage. I think probably over 60% of the PNW crop goes down through the Columbia snake system. Interesting, thank you. On, on barge. Thank you. Um, you know, there's always, we're always hoping that our industry grows, right? We always want to see things sort of expand and get bigger for folks. And if, and if we're thinking about expansion, what does that look like in terms of transportation? Are we talking about new railroads, um, new grain elevators and loading facilities? Um, and I'm thinking maybe Brian, you can answer that. Well, Sam might have a better idea. I think that the companies that I deal with, uh, they realize they've got two options to ship grain by if they, if they expand rail. And sometimes rail becomes more economical and sometimes barge is economical, but also, you know, getting rail cars in a timely manner, getting barges up the river in a timely manner are going to be critical. Um, so, you know, the grain companies, and I think the local grain companies that I can think of, part of the reason they can, they're expanding is they realize they can control that grain and and maybe make a little bit more of a better a little better return on their product rather than letting it go down the put, just putting it on barge okay um there's a, a there's a question there's a couple of questions that have been coming in the chat so i just want to acknowledge thank you folks for asking questions we really appreciate that um i'm gonna throw a couple of these out here and folks who just jump in and answer them Mark Blitzer from the audience asks, if barging has declined by such a large amount, are there enough rail lines remaining to carry the grain if the dams come out? Um, and, and that assumes that, <clears throat> excuse me, and that assumes that the barges will no longer be uh, on the rivers. Who, who do you want? Oh. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's not just the rail lines. The again, kind of going back in time, there was a rail line to every one of these small towns. Those have all been pulled up. The railroad has done what they wanted to do. They consolidated. They made, they forced everybody to go to a, a terminal or a subterminal unit train facility type of atmosphere. And so the the lines, I don't I don't foresee us uh, getting lines back to every town. Uh, we're still going to figure out ways to get them to these terminals. Um, but the, the, what scares me a little bit is the lines going down that are already in place are very crowded. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're very busy. I don't know that the system could handle without some type of expansion. And you know where the, most of them run is right down the Columbia Gorge on both sides. And you can see unit trains coming and going all the time it's it's very busy uh, but not only that cost but then you would have the the cost of building more unit train loaders because the facilities that are here today 
would not be able to handle what you would take away from the river that's being cur currently being used by barge. Yeah, I want to expand on that. That's, that's so true. You know, we would need to um, add more uh, capacity in the rail system. Um, I did, um, I'm not um, like a mathematician, but <laughs> to crunch some numbers and uh, with the help of the internet, uh, and it looks like um, if we moved the grain, you know, barging stopped on the lower snake and we had to move to rail for that amount of wheat, it would be uh, a little less than one more um, shuttle train a day. Uh, and it's it's crowded on, you know, I hear, we all hear it's crowded in the gorge. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know if they could add in, you know, the equivalent of one more shuttle rail a day. Um, but that's, you know, that just so that we know what numbers we're talking about. Um, I, I do want to add that Paul Dedelius, um, we're hoping he can rejoin. Um, he owns a short, um, he's working to expand short haul rail successfully in the region. So it'd be um, interesting to hear from him. Because one thing um, I hear, Sam, and maybe you know more about this, but that um, BNSF prefers not to ship sh uh, to do short haul. And um, is there a solution when you're dealing with um, uh, the rail industry? So we, we do have a rail loader um, just uh, between Rosalia, Washington and Oaksdale, Washington called McCoy. Um, and it is on a short line. It's owned, that line is owned by the state of Washington. However, they lease the operation to that to short haulers. Um, companies probably similar to Paul's uh, that, that come in and run small short line railroads. Uh, they take it to an interchange where the BN in this case picks it up and takes the, the big train. Yes, the uh, Burlington Northern, Union Pacific, they, they don't want to. Um, they, they just want to move the big trains and be done with it. They don't want to take the time to, you know, they're, they get their crews off um, at the interchange, the short line handles it from there. So, I mean, I think that that, that works, we make it work. Um, but I don't, I don't see the, the railroad wanting to go into a bunch of short lines. Mm -hmm. That's a, <clears throat> appreciate hearing about the rail. Um, in another life, I worked on the inner city passenger rail program in the state of Wisconsin um, for the state. And it was, fascinating um, to, to, to work in that field and to learn everything that I did. I, I think the one thing uh, about doing anything with rail, you have the opportunity to do safety upgrades. And I, and I certainly know that there are concerns along the Columbia River with rail um, crossing areas where there's a lot of people, especially around um, fishing in loose sites. I have another question that came from the audience. Ormond Hildebrand, a wheat farmer from Oregon, is in the audience and has asked um, about competition between uh, barges and rails and, and understanding that railroad monopolies drive up the price. Um, and, and that is a concern for farmers. Is that a risk in expanding uh, railroads to the region? You take away the competition and then all of a sudden rail sort of has the biggest say in setting price. So that is that something that we should be concerned about? I think it's a huge concern. And I, I guess I would ask you or any, uh, anybody that's joining us tonight, if you just had uh, all the grocery stores closed down except for one in your town, what's that gonna do? Their prices are gonna go up. I mean, if it's, I'd, I'd hate to call them monopolies because there are two railroads, but the way they service, it's, it's basically, you know, somewhat of a monopoly for the areas that they service. And uh, the, the, I just, I would, that's, that's a, a reason that we like as a company to have both access to rail and river is we feel like we have some leverage uh, that we can choose for our producers what's the most economical way to move their product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that captive shipper question comes up. And uh, I think this evening, our conversation is not going to be, you know, we're not, I think we're going to not find a lot of solutions, but flagging some problems to uh, uh, talk more about. What, when I hear that, though, um, Sam, and this is maybe you can help me understand this. What I always wonder is, you know, Montana doesn't have access to the lower Snake River, they just have rail. So and, and, you know, um, like my cousin, um, 
who farms near Connell, um, you know, he says, generally, if you're north of Highway 26, you're going rail, if you're south, you're going river. So if you don't have that option of the river, um, which is most farmers, um, how does that play out? So most wheat farmers in the West don't have the lower snake as an option. And so do they already deal with that captive shipper problem and how do they solve it? Um, uh, to, a, to a degree, but you, you still have uh, that, that river access. It, it, you know, before, Oops. Uh oh. Uh oh, we lost Sam. We lost you, Sam. <laughs> Start again. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's, it's all good? Yeah, all good. Okay. So, one of the most uh, recent unit train loaders went into uh, it's called Four Lakes, just outside of Spokane, uh, near the Cheney exit. And a lot of that wheat comes from the highway two area back to that area and then gets railed down on the main line. Um, they, how were they moving grain before? Is they were shipping to the river. Mm -hmm. So they still had that access and they still have that today as an option. If uh, rail gets too expensive, they can go by river and they do. There are times uh, in the marketplace that if you've got a, a uh, customer that uh, maybe they've made a lot of corn or soybean sales off the West Coast. I, and I'm talking, that would be product moving from the uh, central part of the United States this way. Uh, and you have a big push for rail that those trains are traded on a secondary market. Uh, one guy says, well, I need it. I need it bad. I'm willing to pay this much over tariff. The next guy says, well, I, I need it worse than that. So I'm willing to pay. And so those rates can go up substantial uh, over a tariff market. And when the rates get too high, then that shipper that is somewhat set for just rail, but still has the river option would move to the river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. I, I just want to do a quick welcome to Paul Dedilius, who's the owner and operator of Columbia Rail. We are talking about rail, all rail right now. So you, you popped on at a great time. Um, curious to know, and I'm going to sort of um, pull you out in the conversation real quick here, Paul. We have been having this conversation about rail and um, the shift to rail if we moved, um, remove the dams and barging wasn't an option. Are there barriers to expanding rail um, short haul versus long haul, haul that you can uh, share with us, um, share with the audience? Folks, you're muted. Sorry. There's uh, missing infrastructure that was really useful to moving grain off of the Palouse and uh, other areas tributary to the Snake River system. You know, as recently as the 1980s, um, that's when most of it was uh, eliminated because the barges, uh, truck barge was basically much more competitive than the class one railroads at the time. Um, I would add that the rate competitiveness of the class one railroads uh, kind of on a cross Washington basis is not necessarily as good as uh, rail barge or truck barge. I think the greatest opportunity for rail to be a, uh, an attractive economic player um, in this snake uh, watershed would be rail, short line rail, down to the head of Columbia navigation in the Pasco area. Mm. Okay. And I, I have a, a question from the audience. Uh, Deborah Ellers in the audience asks, can trains go to other ports besides those on the Columbia, like Tacoma, Seattle, or Grays Harbor? Can they go somewhere else, not down the river? So <clears throat> uh, they, they can and they do. Uh, Tacoma is a big uh, wheat exporting uh, terminal, or it has one. Uh, the majority of the uh, wheat exporting, you know, shipload exporting terminals are 
in what the railroads call the Portland complex, which also includes Vancouver, Longview, Kalama. Um, and it's a little bit farther on the rail to go to Tacoma. Um, none of the grain trains cross the mountains. They all go down the Columbia Gorge. So, you know, that Portland to Longview uh, zone is, is kind of the simplest place to put it on a boat, but there is a terminal in Tacoma as well. Thank you. Um, really appreciate all of the insight on rail for the layperson. I don't think we think about rail all that often, um, certainly mm -hmm. not the mechanics of it or the planning of it. Um, sure. I, I have always been fascinated by trains since I was a kid. It's just been like a thing. I just love them. Um, <laughs> <Me too>. Also, <laughs> also um, I had thought when I was in Wisconsin, I was going to spend my whole career working on trains. That didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, but I'm here and I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to do a slight shift in our conversation since we've been talking a lot about rail. I, I wanted to ask you, Rob. You know, we have just had this whole conversation about ex possible expansion of rail, looking at other alternatives. And I'm curious to know, how does that actually compare to the baked in costs of dam upgrades and maintenance in the coming decades? Is it more or less? Are we or is, is it something that we will have a, a wash? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I find um that this converse, this, not today, just the conversation and the debate in general often devolves into this comparison of costs or relative hardship. And I think that the, we should be coming at this from a different frame. There are costs incurred to do all kinds of stuff in the system, whether you're running rails or barges or you're producing energy or you're managing fish and wildlife. And so often we get lost in the weeds about arguing about the, uh, again, the relative importance or size of the costs. And I like to think about it in terms of, is this a, are these problems that can be solved? So I like to go back to the rail issue and the transportation issue for a second with Sam and Brian and Paul here. You know, to me, I, I get it. You know, if I'm a farmer that's relying on river barge and feel like that's a great uh, check on rail prices. Yeah, I want to know that I'm not going to end up in a bad spot if we make a change like taking out the four dams and not having barge transportation. But that is a solvable problem. If we have the right infrastructure and there is an issue around price potential, you know, this monopolistic pricing, I've, I've heard about this now for decades. I think it's a legitimate concern, as I think everybody on this uh, in this conversation has noted. But I do think that there are policy uh, solutions to that, if need be. Um, so we can, we should be thinking about it in that frame. You know, what I keep coming back to um, in this, in this conversation and the debate overall is, if we're going to have abundant, healthy, harvestable stocks of salmon and steelhead in the Snake River, they need a river. They don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. We can't build them, you know, some other giant waterway that gets them up into this, you know, thousands of miles of really high quality habitat. Um, there isn't a choice there. So it's like, let's let's focus on solving the problems that we have, the ingenuity and potentially the investments to solve. I mean, that's a big issue and people may have their doubts, but let's let's try that because we can't do much more than we're doing right now with the infrastructure that we have in place for the fish. So I'll pause there. Okay, um, I definitely feel like it, what I'm hearing you say is, it, if salmon go extinct, there's no going backwards, right? We can't fix that. That would be an impossibility. Um, we do have a problem in front of us um, that I actually consider to be an opportunity. What are the opportunities that are afforded to um, wheat growers, to transportation, to the Tri-Cities area, to tribal nations here? And, and it's been a really exciting to be a part of these conversations because I think um, as I always say it, on my teams, you know, there's multiple truths uh, across the board on this on this issue. Lots of opinions, lots of truths, 
Um, and sometimes those truths are in conflict. And one of the things that I really value in these dinner series is our ability to come together and talk about some of these things that are hard conversations, right? Um, in, in a way that's respectful and, and hearing from, from different folks. And really appreciate the audience engagement. Um, I have a, a, another question about rail. Um, thinking about the expansion of rail, what are some of the other opportunities that would come to the region if we looked at expanding rail systems in that part of the state? Lisa? Sure. Um, I do want to say I love rail and um, I love taking uh, the sleeper car down the California coast from uh, Portland. That's pretty fantastic. And I remember taking uh, rail from Seattle um, uh, to uh, Pasco, uh, really, you know, when I was in college, like it was easy, it was available. Uh, and we, you know, the rail in Eastern Washington is a problem and it's a fixable problem. And if we fix that problem, uh, we can get more trucks off the highways. Like we have to do a lot of trucking because we have not fixed the rail problem in Eastern Washington. Um, and so, you know, in terms of other industries, yeah, if, if, you know, they, I believe, I'm confident there are other industries that would use rail more if it was uh, a reliable uh, partner to business, which, you know, there are struggles right now with that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, um, I, I just, I wrote in the chat, I love travel by train. My favorite travel takes some time. Also just seeing the parts of the states that you don't normally get to see if you're on the highway or certainly in a plane, it's it's quite amazing. Um, I think there's like these, these big questions about how. Um, moving forward with the removal of the dams, how does that actually happen? That is such a huge thing. The most, um, the, the largest dam removal project in the history of this country. How does that actually happen? Who gets to make the decision and give us the, yes, we can do this? Um, Rob, can you tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah, that's, it is a big decision and it's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, ultimately, I think you're going to need an, an act of Congress. These are federal dams that uh, were authorized by Congress. They'll have to be deauthorized if they're going to be removed. And then you have the agencies that manage the river that need to to actually carry out the the breaching. I mean, what's being? I think it's important to point out that the dams have two major components. There's a a concrete component, and there's an earthen embankment. And the proposal is to remove the earthen portion of the dams, which is known as breaching. So, yeah, there's engineering and planning that goes into doing that. Um, it'll change the hydraulics in the river. Um, so you need to plan for infrastructure that is might be affected by the change in the hydraulics in the river. But ultimately, it's a decision by Congress. And then the, the federal agencies, the Corps, Bonneville Bureau, will be the implementers of the actual removal. Can I add to that and say like, you know, we, when we talk about expanding rail, you know, and it feels like a big challenge. I mean, we put in four dams, we flooded farmland, we flooded archeological sites that were irreplaceable. And um, we had to like condemn all of that land and buy it from people and build big dams. That was a big project. I think put expanding rail where rail used to be and um, and breaching the dams, I think that is less of a big project. I think we can once we once did a big thing and our challenge now is to think big and uh, really tackle not allowing salmon to go extinct in our lifetimes. You know, I just would love to add on to that, Lisa. That's a great point. And I think one of the things that's really neglected in this conversation is you look at natural resources that are in short supply uh, in the United States and even around the world, it's increasingly large sections of free flowing rivers. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's an incredible natural asset that's gonna be extremely popular. If you have 140 miles of free flowing river uh, that's muscular and turbulent and full of life and, uh, 
it's going to be a really big boon, not just for the the fish and wildlife that um, used to inhabit the river before it was dammed, but also for the human communities. I think that again is like a, it's a question of perspective. Are we going to look forward and say, how do we optimize this opportunity? How do we make the most of it? Because it is such an asset. We, we, we are rightly focused on the salmon and the steelhead, which is a very unique resource and has huge importance to the tribes and to uh, non-tribal communities too. But um, the, the, you know, the ecological and the environmental upside of this is much bigger. There were all these riparian zones that were lost. And you know, we're, we're at that point in history where the folks who remember that the river before it was dammed are becoming fewer and fewer. But Trout Unlimited, we just did a story, I think it was two issues ago in our magazine, where we focused on the river that was. You know, we actually had some great photographs and conversations with people who live along the Lower Snake River who used to go there and uh, recreate and fish and hunt. So, um, yeah, but we don't hear about much about that. We don't think about that enough, in my in my yeah. view. I think it's a big part of the future that we're looking toward. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we have a lot to work on for future generations. Um, we are right now uh, being we are we are the ancestors, the future ancestors, right? People of the future are going to look back at all of us and say, "What did you do during that time?" Um, I'm curious to know, Brian, I, I know that you've been engaged in these conversations between farmers and conservationists since at least 2006, um, way longer than I have been a part of this conversation. And, and I'm curious to know, in what ways have you seen this conversation change in recent years? I don't know that it's changed a great deal. There's still, a, you know, a fair number of people here in Eastern Washington that can't imagine life without barges. Um, but truthfully, I don't care how my, my grain gets to market. Um, I ship it the most economical way I can. And if we can control the prices that rail might charge, which I think is done in many industries or subsidized farmers, which is certainly done in our grain in industry, we can find these solutions and update rail um, and uh, we can make a place that we can recreate and in, inhabit the most valuable part of every river and that's the riparian along the edges as humans and uh, maybe restore some salmon in the side as a side benefit but uh, um, but until we put that infrastructure in place I it's it's that's what we have to solve is get that infrastructure in place and make it so that we can ship grain uh, without a great deal of hassle. We don't have too many any roadblocks and that we can get our grain to uh, to the Portland uh, market. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, you know, we're talking about shipping changes in shipping how we do things the need for infrastructure. One of the questions that came from the audience from Donald Miller, uh, he asked, you know, the Simpson plan involves a creation of a shipping annuity to compensate for an increase in shipping costs. So let's say it becomes more expensive, but there's an annuity that helps with that. Is that an, a viable option? And I'm, maybe Sam or Brian, you might have some thoughts about that. Well, I think it certainly is. We, we subsidize, <laughs> we all, us farmers all know that we're subsidized at every turn. Uh, if we have a bad year, we get subsidized, we get funds, uh, and if we have a decent enough excuse, we can get paid by the federal government. Um, this certainly seems like one of those opportunities where it, it comes to us in some form. Um, many would not like the fact that farmers are getting paid to get their grain to market, but um, that's the price of doing business in a federal government. But uh, we could, I think we can work around that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes left. So I'm going to do one more question. And this question is for you, Paul. Uh, Tim Gould in the audience asked, is the main constraint to rail capacity for hauling grain um, 
uh, along the truck line, or excuse me, for hauling grain along the Snake River or the, uh, okay, I'm totally botching this. I apologize to everybody. <laughs> I'm like reading this, it's not coming out. Is the main constraint to rail capacity for hauling grain, the trunk line along the Snake River or the short line spur tracks that connect terminals and loading facilities? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, the rail lines that exist today, uh, whether along the snake or up country uh, from the snake, have what I would consider to be plenty of capacity. Um, they're running at most one train a day in each direction. So um, if you were to tie a damsel to the track, you know, she'd be waiting quite a while to be threatened by the next train. Um, so they have plenty of capacity. <clears throat> They're not, not every mile of the upland, uh, what we call branch line system is necessarily up to a great uh, modern standard for the uh, current weight of cars, but that's, that's very solvable. There's 1.6 billion of short line dedicated funding right now that the short lines around the country are going after, which should uh, help bring a lot of the uh, railroad mileage into the modern standard. What I would consider the main uh, constraint is a lack of connectivity between the short lines and each other, uh, between the short lines and the, uh, the river system, whether that's the current river system or, or a smaller future river system. Um, the big railroads are much more competitive than they were in the 80s and 90s. They've developed train load facilities coming out of Ritzville and also the um, kind of lacrosse Colfax area. So the major railroads are competing to a degree on grain that's not super susceptible to Snake River competition. And they're, they're, they're being more competitive and reaching more, more places than they had in decades past. But there's just gaps in the system that need to be reestablished that were lost when the railroads weren't as competitive. Thank you. Well, I have to well, split. I apologize, uh, uh, but I thank you for uh, bringing me, involving me. Thank you, Paul. We thank appreciate you, Paul. you being here. I'm going to hand it back over to Johanna, and um, and thank you to all the panelists and all of you out there with your amazing questions. Really appreciated those. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you everyone on our panel today. Just a note for you guys, if you find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens, feel free to start typing any answers to questions from the audience that you feel that you can speak to um, as we're going through the rest of our program. I'd like to now take a moment to invite Abby to come on and share some opportunities for our audience to provide some input or take some action on this issue. Thanks, Johanna, and thank you so much to all the experts who joined us today. Um, I've enjoyed all of these um, webinars that have taken place today and really appreciate the conversations that are happening. I know it's not always easy to talk about the nitty gritty details of this, but really appreciate that we have this public forum here for folks to listen and to learn more. Um, and I am a grassroots coordinator with Idaho Conservation League, and I'm here today to talk about ways that you can get involved, ways that you can take action if something here resonated today, if you've followed this for decades, if you're just learning about it recently. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can take action. And I feel incredibly fortunate to be involved in this issue at a time where elected officials are paying attention. We've seen leadership from elected officials across the region, whether it's Representative Simpson in Idaho, Earl Blumenauer in Oregon, Governor Brown in Oregon, or most recently, Senator Murray and Governor Inslee in Washington state. And last October, Governor Inslee and Senator Murray announced a joint federal process to analyze and assess the benefits provided by the dams, what it would take to replace them, what's needed for salmon and steelhead recovery. Um, they are releasing a draft of that report in the next week or two. It'll be online where you can review all, however many pages it's gonna be, whatever executive summary they're gonna have, and they will have a 30 day public comment period where you can provide your input. So you can take a look at these conversations that they've been having, the research that they've pulled, take a look at it, provide your input, state why this issue is important to you. And that's a direct way where they can hear your feedback. 
that's really incredible because you don't always necessarily have a direct way. You could send an email, you could make a phone call, and those are great, but we're really looking forward to this public comment period that's coming up. You can learn more about that and their process at lsrdoptions.org, and we'll definitely update you when that public comment period launches. And finally, I wanted to share another incredible way that you can take action and share your opinion, share your thoughts on this issue is by writing a letter to the editor. LTE's letter to the editor are still um, a really powerful way to have your voices heard, even in today's day and age, whether you're reading it online or reading it um, in your local newspaper. Um, this is a way where you can share whether you heard something tonight or heard something in one of our previous webinars and an event you attended recently. That's a way where you can share your opinion, your thoughts um, with your local community and how it can be shared more widely too. So I think there's just a link in the chat dropped that has some best practices, has some tools and tips that you can use um, to write those letter to, letters to the editor. Um, and I encourage, especially if you heard something tonight that made you feel inspired um, for ways that we can um, take a look at the situation and come out together with all stakeholders across the region. I encourage you to jot some thoughts down tonight and submit a letter to the editor. Thanks, Johanna. Thank you so much, Abby, for sharing those ways to take action. Uh, we have about six minutes left and I'd like to invite our panelists back on along with our moderator, Alyssa, just to share some brief words to close us out. We were lost without our moderator there for a second. Here we are. We can't speak Here without we you, Alyssa. I was shaking with fear. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Too funny. Well, why don't we, <clears throat> we have, uh, now we have five minutes left. <laughs> um, Lisa, why don't you start out and uh, with some closing thoughts? Yeah, I want to get back to that big picture Rob was talking about. And, um, you know, I, I, I know, um, you know, that grain shipped by rail in um, in Washington before, I mean, those, those dams went in about 50 years ago and those wheat farms have been there longer. Um, and, uh, and I think we don't, it's a question of cost on both sides. Yes, it'll, it, it'll be a serious investment to expand, re-expand rail, but it's a continual investment in the barge side. And also we're losing we're losing the fishing industry on the coast. We're decimating um, communities on the coast. Uh, tribal communities have been especially hard hit by the loss of salmon. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's inconvenient to go back to rail probably, but would we, would we trade that inconvenience if, if it means that people have their livelihoods if people have their culture going forward, um, and if we don't uh, drive this species to extinction like that, we don't come back from that. Uh, and I think one thing that um, Rob touched on that we maybe didn't really talk enough about is what we gain when we um, remove those dams. We open up on the order of 500 miles of incredible habitat and it's cold water habitat. Um, it going, you know, into a future with uncertain but hotter climate, we we know we need cold water for salmon to live, and and this is our last best option. Rob, well, um, I think that the the conversation in the region is shifting in an important and positive direction. And you know, for for decades now, I feel like we've had the pro salmon camp, and then we've had the pro dam camp, and it's just you know kind of constant uh, argument. Um, but I'm, I think we're starting to see a different schism. Um, there's the people who are ready to work together to find solutions, whether that's solutions to moving grain and commodities and saving fish and producing clean energy and the folks who are just insisting that they know the answer and they don't wanna roll up their sleeves and work with other people. I know where I fall in that, which camp I fall into. I think uh, I suspect that the folks on this call probably fall, fall into that camp too. And I, I just think it's a matter of applying ourselves to achieving a vision for the future 
that um, addresses all these important issues. We don't have to choose. This should not be a zero sum game. It's going to cost money. It's going to take a lot of planning. But we live in one of the most special places on the planet. You know, we're blessed with these rivers. We're blessed with these fish. We're blessed with these fertile lands. And my God, wouldn't it be great if we couldn't apply ourselves so we 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 make sure we have those things for the future? That's what I'm excited about. I want to work with people to find that vision, to realize that vision. Thank you, Rob. Brian, closing thoughts. Rob, I certainly uh, second your motion. And uh, I feel that if we can solve this rail issue, we've got the infrastructure, we can get the infrastructure in place, then farmers will get on board. Um, we can't, you know, charge them an arm and a leg if we're gonna ship by rail only, but that's a solvable problem. We can move forward. And let's face it, anybody out there using your grandmother's refrigerator, it's too old. Um, so, and I'm not using my grandfather's Model T. I wish I had it, but uh, it's too old. Uh, that dam, those dams are going to continue to escalate the cost to maintain and operate them. And uh, as we change the way we farm, I think we can change the way we get our wheat to market. But we have to keep the farm whole. Thank you, Brian. Sam, closing thoughts. Sure, thank you. First, I'd like to, for the opportunity to be invited tonight and to be able to be on the conversation. I've really appreciated it. Um, I don't know that I jump in one camp or the other, or uh, I just, I want, you know, I want to see if there's a way that we can get fish back here but yet we have to look at how can we do it and still get our product to the marketplace mm -hmm. in a timely, uh, financially viable fashion. And I, as Brian alluded to, it's a solvable. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that have to be answered. Uh, you know, we're, uh, I'd look at things on a practical level and I'm, I'm seeing fish runs being less on undammed rivers. So that makes me ask other questions that have nothing to do with the Columbian snake. Um, what's, what's going on there? Is that affecting our, our rivers down here? And I, so I'm kind of simple in that way. And I guess a lot of people would like some of those questions answered before we're just ready to say, okay, we're gonna jump in this with both feet and we're gonna figure out this rail situation uh, it's not easy, but we'll figure it out. Um, I think if we can work on solving all these problems, there's a lot of issues, whether it's electricity, uh, transportation, recreation. It's, this, is a, this is a huge, big issue. And it's not just about four dams on the Snake River. It's, it's bigger than that. And I think you'd get more farmers uh, on board you know, if we could answer some of these other questions first, but, um, you know, I, I represent a, a group of farmers through our co-op that are, you know, very uh, conservative in, in how they go, go about doing business. And, you know, change is not easy. It's not easy for anybody, but it's not, I don't think, you know, they've adapted their farms. They're farming differently than their grandfathers were as Brian mentioned. So it's not impossible. Um, we have some struggles, I think, starting out here so that we can talk and, and be respectful of each other is a, is a great start. And I, I hope that we can keep this going. Thank you so much. <clears throat> First of all, I just wanna thank all the panelists for your time and energy for being a part of this panel and sharing your thoughts your, your hopes, your concerns. It's really important for us to hear a multitude of voices on this issue because it is extremely complex. There are so many factors to think about when we talk about the removal of the four Snake River dams. It's not a small project. It would be the most, uh, the largest project in the history of this country if, if it moves forward. Um, I came to this work because uh, as a tribal person, I have a deep um, respect and love for Waikanish, our relative 
to salmon. Um, my people are connected to the Columbia River, original uh, stewards of that land, uh, now living on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. Uh, I came to this work because I care about salmon, but I also care about people. And I see myself as part of an ecosystem that includes all living things, um, that I'm related to all living things, including each of you that's on this panel and everyone that's uh, joining us tonight. We're, we're all connected. We're all a part of this system of life. And we are also um, in this moment uh, doing the work that is going to be our legacy work. What will our relatives in the future, our grandchildren, their grandchildren, look back and see us doing to ensure that we have um, the ability to have a future? And when I think about a future, I think about the ability for people to continue to fish, to continue to farm, to continue to have a, a life and, and, a, and a way of life that feels good to you in the future. And I think that's the, the point where I heard you like pro fish, uh, pro farmer. I'm kind of in this thing about uh, pro earth. Like I would like us all to continue to survive as a species. And I think we're gonna have to make some bold choices and we're gonna need to come together, put our minds together, um, ask the hard questions, have respectful conversation, and also to engage in the process. Um, Abby shared with, uh, with you that there's ways to engage for public input. I encourage you to be a part of those processes. Uh, we need to know what the concerns are, um, what the hopes are, what your vision is as part of this process so that we can land on the best solution going forward. So democracy is as good as we make it. So I encourage you to be a part of it. And again, just want to thank all of you for joining in tonight and all of the panelists. Really appreciate your time, energy, and good words this evening. Thank and with you. that, I think we're done. We're a little bit over. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>